Hi everyone, I'm Tamara Banks. Welcome to this edition of Dialogue Denver DA. Mitch, great to see you. Good to see you, Tamara. We have a really awesome guest today. I'm we so do. excited. <laughs> we do. We have the Attorney General of the State of Colorado, Cynthia Kaufman, and I'm honored to have her on the show. Cynthia, I'm so glad you're here. You're taking time out of your busy, busy schedule. So uh, everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people get confused about the what you each do. So mm -hmm. maybe we can start with sort of laying out the basics about what your offices do, maybe starting with Denver first. And uh, Mitch, your area is really, your folks work in Denver, city and county of Denver and surrounding area. Tell us more about that. Just Denver. Mm -hmm. uh, the city and county of Denver is the second judicial district of the state of Colorado. The confusion usually doesn't come with the attorney general. It comes with the city of Denver. Everybody thinks I'm a city employee. Everybody thinks my lawyers are city, like the city attorneys, that kind of thing. We are completely independent of Denver. We are a state agency. We are state prosecutors. We only work in Denver. If we had another county and our judicial district was bigger, then we would be in that county as well. But it's, some of it has to do with the uniqueness of Denver. But if you think about it, I'm the only elected official, state official, in the second judicial district. Our judges aren't elected. They're retained by election, our state judges. So the confusion usually comes with the city and they... You know, they'll write articles. Even the reporters get confused. You know, the DA doesn't comply with the city ethics <laughs> rules. The city council tries to make me part of a committee, and they can't do that. They have no authority over me. But they do uh, my budget. So I do have a connection. <laughs> All the DAs are funded by the counties that they represent and not by the state. So I get no funding from the state of Colorado. It all comes from the city and county of Denver. And the city does have city attorneys, but you and your team are district attorneys. And we're independent of the city attorney. We're independent of the attorney general. Uh, the governor's not my boss. Uh, it's a really nice position to have. <laughs> exactly. Great job if you, if you can get it. So, Cynthia, tell us more about the attorney general's position and your team. Well, as the attorney general, I'm a constitutionally elected statewide official. And as Mitch said, we don't really have, we have a working relationship, but we don't have any sort of reporting or structural relationship. We're just partners. The Attorney General is the lawyer for the people of the state of Colorado, and then for an advisor to the governor and the statewide elected officials, all the departments of state government, and then the many boards and commissions. We do mostly civil work on behalf of the state. So when the state gets sued, we defend them. Uh, but we do have some criminal jurisdiction, and then we work with the 22 elected district attorneys like Mitch uh, to get prosecutions done around the state. So you mentioned the word partner. Talk a little bit about where you do sort of interface and, and work as partners. Well, we have, uh, Cynthia runs a statewide grand jury. And we're lucky that it's in Denver. And oftentimes, the people that do criminal prosecution for her, uh, they will pick up some cases that are multi-jurisdictional, including Denver. And so what they then do is they contact me and maybe Stan Garnett in Boulder and maybe someone in Adams, depending on how wide the ring, whatever it is they're prosecuting is, and say, do you mind if we prosecute these people and I think that there's a statutory there's rules about that and I have never once said no I'm gonna take these people because I know Cynthia's group does a fantastic job uh, if they do a warrant sometimes on some of those investigations they contact me for a no-knock warrant for instance the DA has to okay that in their jurisdiction so we work really closely together and then once they indict somebody then they ask me to swear them in if they're going to try the case in Denver. They could do it in Adams, they could do it in Boulder, depending on where the judge says this is going to be, the judge has that say. But once they come in, then they ask me to deputize them so they can go ahead and finish the case that they started the investigation on. And it is really good to have that because 
I don't have jurisdiction outside of Denver, with the exception of some kinds of check cases and that kind of thing. So it's great to have somebody that has a team that can bring these rings in and go after them, and they use their resources to do it. So it's easy for me to sign something, and I don't have to worry about paying for it. And they really do incredible work when it comes to drug rings, identity theft rings, uh, human trafficking rings, and things that are kind of beyond my reach jurisdiction-wise. And you're also both very uh, involved and committed to consumer fraud. Talk to me a little bit about that, Cynthia, about why that's so important for, for our uh, residents of the state of Colorado. Well, one of the statutory responsibilities of the Attorney General is to protect consumers from fraud, and there's plenty of it. Uh, the district attorneys also have fraud units within their offices, and we work together with them on cases, doing this joint prosecution a lot of times. Uh, what you see in consumer protection case, cases is that people who are, are scam artists don't necessarily stick to one part of the state. Uh, they will move around. They'll have victims in different counties and different judicial districts. So I'll work with the, the district attorneys around the state to prevent fraud. And we have a website I'd like to, folks to know about in the Attorney General's office called stopfraudcolorado.gov. It is a way for people to report if they've been scammed. Uh, you know, the IRS scams have, are still uh, continuing and we get calls about that all of the time, someone impersonating an Internal Revenue Service agent saying they're coming with a warrant. We want people to call and report those sort of things, and so does Mitch's office, so that we can go after those folks and, and try to put an end to scams. And I imagine the most vulnerable are the very uh, most vulnerable people in our society, the seniors and maybe physically and uh, mentally disabled folks. They become your biggest targets, I imagine. That's true. And then members of the military and veterans hmm. are also targeted. So that's another population that tends to get a lot of these phone calls and contacts from scammers. So talk to me about your community engagement around this, the, the fraud protection. I'd love to. Uh, when I was elected attorney general, when I was running for the office, I realized how many people don't know what the attorney general does. So I appreciate you going through that with us, uh, with everybody today. And I realized that the thing that people understand is where the attorney general's office intersects with their daily lives. That's consumer protection and fraud prevention and areas of public safety. And I chose some things to focus on, school safety, preventing domestic violence and sex assault, and human trafficking, and then substance abuse prevention. So those are some of the areas where we work with communities around Colorado to put together programs and find resources for folks. And, and let me give you an example of that. And, you know, Cynthia was in office a very short period of time. And I went up and met with her and said, we're building this domestic violence service center, the Rose Andam Center. We've done shows on it. And I said, I know, for instance, that you have funds. Because a lot of times what the attorney general will do is they will settle cases where somebody's uh, an operations involved in mortgage fraud or something along those lines, and they have that money. And so what I was after money. And uh, Cynthia, I knew, was committed to preventing domestic violence mm -hmm. and not only preventing it, but what happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to find a good fit with the funds that they had, and I was amazed. I sat down with her and explained where we were and she said, if you could write a grant for us that would show how your center will have a long-term impact on housing for victims of domestic violence, we will give you some money. And, and I had been in the money-raising business for a very short time, but I had learned a very hard lesson, and that is ask how much. <laughs> and so I asked her how much, and, and, and she said a million dollars. And I was like, you know, we we're trying to raise $13 million. Gosh. And the biggest donors we had at that point had given us a million dollars. And we were lucky. We had two. Um, and I said, yeah, we, we can do that. And we wrote the grant. 
and we got the check and we put that towards this center. And without Cynthia, I really, really wonder if we would have hit our goal, if we would have gotten that center open. And then she went a step further and gave us one of her best people to be on the board of the Domestic Violence Center. Mm -hmm. And so she's, she has someone from her office committed to the board, and I know her plan is kind of like our plan, but she can have a bigger impact than I can, and that is to have this type of center in different parts of the state of Colorado. So we're having the same kind of impact in La Junta that we're having in Denver. Maybe not the same center, because obviously the needs are different there, but Cynthia understands that. And for her to step up and do that, it wasn't political, obviously. I'm elected out of Denver. I'm a Democrat. You know, it had nothing to do with any of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just, it was one of those things that in the 12 years that I've been a district attorney, I was amazed. And I haven't had, I've thanked her on many occasions, but I'd like to take the opportunity to thank her again on behalf of those women and children that suffered domestic violence in Denver. And it's such a gift to the community. It's a one-stop shopping for people who don't know what it is. You can get go there and not have to go to five or six different locations to get the needs uh, given that you are, are needing at that particular time in your, in your life. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, and hopefully we'll see those around the, the state. You also mentioned um, scam artists and how they can kind of move around the state. I imagine um, drug dealers and uh, those kinds of folks can sort of, you know, start in Denver or move around to, you mentioned La Hunter or Colorado Springs or wherever. Talk about how your programs and, and some of the efforts that you're working on that are um, helping the statewide uh, issues around drug abuse and drug uh, trafficking. You're right. We do, unfortunately, have a serious problem with both prescription drug abuse and opioid addiction, and they are related. Um, oftentimes, folks who have gotten a prescription for a painkiller because they've had a surgery get addicted mm -hmm. to the painkiller, and when they can no longer get a prescription, they turn to other drugs. As a substitute, heroin is chief among those because it is quite cheap and there is a lot of it coming in to Colorado now. Uh, so we have counties with some of the highest drug overdose rates in the country. Uh, I am the head of the Colorado Substance Abuse Trend and Response Task Force that was started by our state legislature. And we look at those numbers uh, as well as law enforcement reports and we work with social services and first responders and. We found um, 17 counties in Colorado that have the highest death rates from opioid overdoses and decided that we needed to address um, that particular public health crisis that we are having in Colorado. So my office was able to help first responders and law enforcement get um, Narcan, which is the drug naloxone. Narcan is a nasal spray form of it and it reverses an opioid overdose. So we have purchased um, 2,500 packages of Narcan. We're going out, we're doing training for law enforcement around Colorado in these counties scattered all over Colorado, mm -hmm. and we're saving lives. Mitch, I know you're very much involved with Denver's uh, drug court. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, I think we've talked about drug court before. Uh, when I took over from Bill Ritter, he kind of sadly said, you know, you're going to be the DA that has to close the doors on the drug court. We have no funding for it. And so what we did was we went to the city, we got the city to use some of that money they were using to build the jail. They set aside money to keep people out of the jail. And we took that money and we ran with a new drug court that has had uh, an incredible impact. So we never had to shut the doors, but we got it going up again. It's kind of modeled differently and it's been doing great. One of the sad things about it is that um, we have seen a huge increase in heroin. Uh, heroin has taken our city and taken our state and I wanna thank Cynthia for her leadership there. We deal with those kids, uh, those folks that are addicted to heroin. It's a very, very nasty thing to be addicted to. So many of them start addicted to opiates. Uh, we even take people addicted to opiates. Uh, we take everybody that qualifies for drug court, and what we try to do is get them clean and sober, uh, give them the skills to stay clean and sober, and get out of the criminal justice system. 
and you know we graduate an awful lot of people. The sad thing I think about heroin is that I mean I know kids that grew up with my son that are addicted to heroin. They come from good families. Um, it's not one of those drugs. It's a drug that attacks all of us and all of our kids and all of our families are at risk because of the opiates. And so her leadership, Cynthia's leadership, has just been really important to kind of pull back that ugly secret that some ham families have. You know, my daughter's a heroin addict or my son's a heroin addict. Mm -hmm. And we have to face this up front. It's a national problem. The attorney generals across the country are doing that. And I think their leadership is going to help us deal with this. Uh, it is a huge problem in every state in the United States, and it's going to continue to be until we get a grip on it and start to control the overprescription of opioids. Uh, the fact that opioids sit in people's <laughs> cabinets and should be destroyed because they're not using them. All of those kinds of things is what we need to work on. I know another issue that's very near and dear to both your hearts, particularly yours, um, Mitch, is, is DNA uh -huh. testing. And is you're at the forefront of the entire issue. Talk about what the, um, your office has done and how that plays a role in some of the things that the Attorney General is working on statewide. Well, the Attorney General has always supported us when we've gone in to try to change the law around DNA, about you know trying to get that group of people that we know are are prevent are not preventing are actually violating women and children in our community. Ninety percent of the crimes we solve with DNA, the violent crimes, women are the victims of those crimes, and they're crimes like rape and murder. The kids, the, the next ten percent are kids. Very rarely is it man on man, it's men on women and children. And we've always had attorney generals, including Cynthia, that support what we're trying to do around the DNA database, our DNA work, uh, getting the backlog of untested rape kits mm -hmm. tested, all of those kinds of things. She's, Cynthia's been a great partner in those things. Talk a little bit about why that's so important to you. Well, the, the issue of sex assault, uh, something that I have focused on for a number of years and in my practice and just has been a personal interest of mine, how can we prevent this from happening? Um, because it, it has a long-term, a lifelong impact on a victim of intimate partner violence or of sexual assault. And um, we lose folks to, to suicide and to addiction uh, when they are trying to deal with the consequences of an assault. So if we can do something, folks like Mitch and myself, to help prevent those crimes from happening, um, then that is a, that's a very positive thing for our communities. It's one of the areas that I have been focusing on with my Office of Community Engagement, and there's great work being done around the state of Colorado to prevent Sex, sex assault and to deal with folks who have been victims of the crime. We're fortunate we have really good resources in our state. Because it really does, in the end, impact our entire society, right? It's not yeah. just the, the individual. Talk to me about the, the Haven program. What is yes. that about? So a, a Haven is one of these prevention programs that I was speaking of. It is an online education program that was developed by a group called Everfight Incorporated. And we are launching it at six of our college and university campuses in Colorado. And the Attorney General's office is underwriting the costs of that. So a Haven will be used as a training tool, particularly for incoming students. Uh, and it is an hour long program. They watch interactive, they watch videos and have interactive question and answer. Uh, and folks have told us that, students have told us that the, the videos really help them understand what the precursors are to a potential sexual assault or um, stalking situation or relationship violence. They teach what the red flags are and then how to intervene. Uh, so we're not only hoping to prevent people from becoming victims themselves by going through the Haven program, but also being good bystanders and witnesses and helping their friends uh, and uh, dorm mates, uh, sorority sisters to avoid situations that could become dangerous. I think it's going to be a very successful program in Colorado. 
And is that something that would then obviously be available to everyone throughout the state, not just in yes. particular cities? Yes, we have started with six campuses, but uh, there's already a lot of interest on other campuses, and so I think we will see it spread throughout Colorado and all of our students will have an opportunity to learn from Haven. Go ahead. I was well, and that, that plays right into what we're doing around Title IX. Mm -hmm. I don't think people realize how many campuses there are in Denver. We have a lot of college students here. There's a federal law, Title IX, that instructs colleges what they have to do when someone's being stalked and someone's uh, been sexually assaulted, there's been violence on campus. So what we've done is brought, built a group of all of the people that do Title IX in Denver, along with the police department, along with my office, and what we do is make sure they're not stepping on each other's toes. Mm -hmm. And so there's an investigator for the college that's talked to a rape victim and you know, when the Denver police show up to do their job, well, wait a minute, I've already talked to an investigator. And so what that's kind of the same thing that we're trying to do. This will dovetail great into that because then that gives people like, well, yeah, I need to report this. I need to stop this. I need to prevent this. I need to give this person advice to go and get a sex assault examination, that type of thing. So it really dovetails well into what we're doing. In the, the couple of minutes that we have left here, I, I, is this good, healthy partnership between the Attorney General's office and the DA's office something normal, or is this something that you guys are sort of uh, unusual um, in, in having this great working relationship? Well, I can tell you that I've been lucky while I've been the DA. I've had very, very good Attorney Generals. I love John Southers. John Southers was great. We went around together. We talked about consumer fraud. Uh, there is sometimes some conflict, but not between us. But my, my economic crime unit sometimes steps on their, their toes a little bit. Uh, we will get state agencies that, uh, that want us to prosecute things, and we're like, oh, you know, why, why us? Well, the person didn't pay their taxes in Denver. Usually somebody has to do something in Denver to get prosecuted, not not do something in Denver. <laughs> but my economic crime unit is very aggressive, and I think sometimes, um, but that's why we have ju dual jurisdiction, and I think it really works well. The fact that she can do those cases and I can do those cases helps the victim of those cases. And if somebody does them and holds the people accountable and gets restitution, that's that's good by me, and I think that's important. So it's really a key. How she works with the other DAs, you'll have to ask them, because I'm not really part. I haven't been part of the other DAs for some time, but that was primarily financial. Right. I just want to add and to thank Mitch for the great relationship that we have been able to have uh, with his office during his tenure. I'm going to miss him, and we all are. Uh, very much in that role because he has done so much for the city and county of Denver, but for the whole state. And he has, as you can tell, uh, been just terrific to work with cooperatively. The people of Denver um, should be very grateful for what they have had and, uh, and acknowledge that as you go on to other things, Mitch. So thank you. Thank you. So much thank for you. that. Thanks so much for being here. Cynthia, I know your, your days are, are very busy and we appreciate the work that you've done throughout the state and um, really appreciate your, your time. Thank you to Attorney General Cynthia Kaufman for being here and our guest today with Denver DA Mitch Morrissey on this edition of Dialogue Denver DA. Join us next time. Thanks for being here. I'm Tamara Banks. We'll see you next time.